community meeting tonight about mountain lion safety. My name is Javon Grogan, uh, and I have the pleasure of serving as the city manager uh, here for the city of San Bruno. I'm joined in this conference room by Jennifer Brazil, our assistant to the city manager and chief people officer, and Jennifer Diano, our assistant to the city manager that put together uh, this uh, lovely community meeting. Tonight's uh, presentation, I will also be joined by our police chief uh, and Terrace Castine from the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. Uh, so why don't we begin? Uh, I will begin sharing my screen. So tonight's presentation uh, is being recorded. It is being live streamed. It is available on Zoom, and it is also being shown on Channel One, our local government access channel. Um, I want to also say that uh, individuals from the city of Pacifica, as well as the city of Millbury, have been invited tonight uh, to, to join us. And so we may have uh, people from outside of the city of San Bruno. So let's begin with our objective. Uh, what is our objective? Why are we having this community meeting? Well, it's really simple. Our, our objective is to educate, uh, to help our community stay safe. Uh, given the increase in mountain lion sightings and other wildlife uh, sightings across the Bay Area, uh, our city team really partnered with the California Department of Fish and Wildlife to offer this virtual meeting uh, so everyone in the community, not just in San Bruno, but our neighboring municipalities know exactly what to do if you encounter a mountain lion. So our goals for this presentation are really uh, four, four items. We want you to leave this presentation with, uh, first and foremost, that education on, on mountain lions. Second, an understanding of how the California Department of Fish and Wildlife manages mountain lions in our area. And it, it's truly a, a, um, a interdepartmental effort, uh, but they are the, the lead agency. And so we'll talk about the interface between the city, uh, be, uh, the county, our animal services, uh, and most importantly, uh, the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. Uh, again, we'll talk about uh, what you do if you encounter a mountain lion. And then, uh, last but not least, how and when uh, to report a mountain lion sighting. Uh, uh, many of us are on social media, uh, and in a minute we'll have a few videos from social media. And oftentimes, in the comments of those videos, there are questions of, how do I report this? Who do I report this to? Um, there, did you report that? Why don't you report that? And so uh, through tonight, we really want to talk about exactly how and when, uh, and we, we want you to be armed with, with knowledge. So our agenda, uh, we'll, we'll first have some introductions. We'll do a first recap of uh, incidents that have occurred recently. Uh, then uh, we will have a presentation uh, on living with mountain lions uh, from the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. Uh, and and uh, we will, again, talk about uh, how and uh, when to report. And then we'll have Q&A. Uh, and so all of you will be able to uh, raise your hand. Uh, that will be moderated uh, by myself and our city clerk. Uh, and we'll provide instructions on how to raise your hand if you're on the phone uh, or uh, online via Zoom. So uh, let's begin with, with welcome. So, as I said, uh, Javon Grogan, uh, the city manager, uh, the end of next month will mark three years that I've had the pleasure uh, to be the city manager here in San Bruno. Uh, and my, my role, I am the chief executive officer for the city. Uh, I support uh, the entire organization, ensuring that we provide excellent services to the residents of San Bruno and our business community. And I also serve uh, as the chief advisor uh, to the city council and ensure that they receive sound policy analysis. Uh, next, I want to turn it to our police chief, Ryan Johansson, for a quick introduction. Thank you very much, City Manager Grogan. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Ryan Johansson. I currently have the pleasure of serving as the chief of police for the city of San Bruno. Uh, I have been with the city of San Bruno's police department for about 16 years at this point, and I come here by way of the San Diego Police Department prior to that. Uh, as the chief of police, obviously my primary responsibility is that I'm ultimately accountable for the safety and security of the residents of San Bruno and the people who visit here. Uh, however, I am not the person who does that work every day. You have dedicated 49 sworn peace officers, dispatchers, community service officers, um, all that work at the police department and work day to day to provide that safety. So I'm here as the police contact for the meeting and uh, mostly here to answer questions that might come up in the Q&A. Thank you. 
Karis, you want to say hi, but I need you have a, a couple background slides on yourself that we'll save for later. Okay, sure, yeah. Uh, Paris Castine, I'm a wildlife biologist with California Department of Fish and Wildlife. Uh, one of the counties I cover is San Mateo, but I also cover Santa Clara, Santa Cruz, and San Francisco County. More on my background later. Okay, so let's begin with a little bit of our terrain. We live in mountain lion habitat. Um, and so we know that uh, just to the west of San Bruno, uh, between us and other communities on the coast, there's the Sweeney Ridge Trail, there's uh, San Francisco watershed lands, as well as the San Andreas Trail, literally thousands of acres of open space right on our western border, uh, as well as pockets of open space uh, within the city of San Bruno. Uh, and to some extent, uh, having mountain lion sightings in portions of our community, uh, as I've learned, uh, is normal. Uh, and uh, it's something that living in this wildland urban interface we will experience. Uh, but they're also concerning. Um, I'm a resident of the community. I'm a resident uh, in that wildland urban interface. Uh, they're concerning to me. They're concerning to my family. Uh, and I know that they're also concerning to a number of members uh, in our community. Uh, and so um, it, it, it's a part of where we live. Uh, but increasingly, we're seeing mountain lion sightings in the more urban uh, parts uh, of our city and down um, uh, towards El Camino Real, that there, there have been sightings, uh, not recently in our community, but in other communities around El Camino Real, uh, which is where people typically wouldn't uh, expect to uh, have a mountain lion sighting. And so we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. And so next, uh, let's show a few, uh, well, before we show the images on uh, recent incidents, let's, let's talk about them. So the California Department of Fish and Wildlife uh, to date has responded to seven instances of well, mountain lion uh, interactions in urban areas uh, in our region, uh, which is adjacent to the Santa Cruz Mountains over Santa Cruz Mountains over the last year. So seven, and typically there's one or two. Uh, and what we also know uh, from social media is that uh, many residents are capturing mountain lion sightings uh, on their social media cameras. And so let's take a look at a few of them. Uh, the first one is from San Bruno on April 11th. And the resident uh, that posted this video uh, in the comments said, oh, oh my, my kids were just out here. Uh, the next one is, was, was in Pacifica on April or 13th. May have been quick, but just on the middle portion. Pacifica uh, on April 17th. And Millbrae on May 17th. So you, we're showing images not just in San Bruno, uh, but other our other neighboring communities, because we, we know mountain lions do not respect our municipal boundaries. And so the next incident that we want to talk about that may, um, uh, uh, we released a press release and was, was captured on a regional and statewide news occurred on May 27th, uh, May 25th, and I'll turn it to our police chief to talk about this incident. Yes, thanks, City Manager Grogan. So as it says here on the slide, on May 25th of this year, we had a particularly uh, troubling mountain lion encounter in the city of San Bruno. It actually occurred up on Ross Way, um, sort of up on the hill as we refer to it in San Bruno, in which a mountain lion actually entered an occupied residence uh, by breaking through a glass window and entering into that residence. Uh, we believe that the motivation for the mountain lion to do this is that immediately inside of the window that the mountain lion broke, um, there were a number of taxidermy trophy heads, large ones, um, that were mounted on the interior walls. And uh, obviously we'll never know for sure, but it seems logical that uh, the mountain lion had seen these things and that had been what attracted it to the interior of the residence. Um, essentially the mountain lion broke the glass plate window and entered the residence and was found by the homeowner at just after midnight on that date uh, on the homeowner's couch. And what's particularly of interest is that as soon as the homeowner encountered the mountain lion and came into the living room and, and saw the mountain lion, the mountain lion 
was scared off and immediately exited through the same window that it, it came through and, and entered initially. Uh, that mountain lion was never located. Uh, there was some, some blood indicating that the mountain lion might have had minor injuries from breaking into the glass window, um, but no injuries to the resident or to any other uh, animals or, or, or human beings as a result of the incident itself. Uh, as the city manager said, we put out a press release that same morning uh, to make sure that this information got out because obviously it'd be very concerning for residents. Um, and we've, to my knowledge, as I said, I've been with the city for 16 years. We've, we've never had an instance like this in which a mountain lion actually entered a residence. Um, so it is an, an isolated incident, but one of concern nonetheless. Okay. And next we'll begin our presentation by Terrace Castine from the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. Great. Thank you so much. Um, we can skip over this slide. Uh, um, so this is just a little bit about the job that I do um, and how long I've been with the department. Uh, 13 years I've been in this particular job with the department for just over nine years. Um, I've been a wildlife biologist <laughs> for 25 years, and I do a number of uh, different job duties. Um, one is the conflict wildlife calls and educating the public on um, various wildlife interactions and that kind of thing. But I also manage our unsapped um, ecological reserves that are about 10,000 acres um, in the four counties I covered, uh, which I mentioned earlier. Um, I also issue depredation permits um, for animals, game animals that are causing damage. Um, deal with welfare animals that are that are injured. What are we going to do with them? Where are we going to take them? Um, how are we going to get them in hand? Um, I also deal with uh, land acquisition and, and big game management. So I'm doing a lot of things. I'm juggling a lot of stuff, um, but happy to be here tonight to, to give some education on a mountain lion. Uh, I just put our website up here. There's a lot of really great information. Um, we have a whole page on mountain lion with a bunch of links. And so uh, most of the stuff in the presentation that I'm giving tonight is included in our website, um, along with a bunch of other stuff. So I'd encourage you, if you want to learn more, um, to, to go to that website and visit it later. Go ahead. Um, identification. This is, uh, I, I can't see the slide. There it is. OK, great. Um, so we get a lot of calls about mountain lion, and one, the first thing we want to do is like verify if the sighting was actually a mountain lion. A lot of times when you see a wild animal, um, you know, we get worked up and maybe aren't paying attention, and, or maybe we think it's a lot bigger than it actually is. Um, so we like to, you know, ask a question about, you know, what did it look like? What was it doing? That kind of thing. Um, so coloration is good, but sometimes they're in shadows. Um, the, the biggest thing that we're looking for in identifying a mountain lion as a mountain lion is, you know, what did the tail look like? So if you don't see anything else, look for this really long tail. Um, and of course, it needs to look cat-like. Um, coyotes also can have long tails, but they're much, much bushier. They're just a, generally a smaller animal. Um, and so so the, the long tail is pretty key. Uh, male mountain lion, adult mountain lions average about 120 pounds. The females are a little bit smaller. They're about 80 pounds. So there's a little bit of a size difference there. Um, kittens, which we don't often get to see, uh, again, have that long tail. If it's a bobcat, bobcats have really short bob tails. Um, so that's a good way to tell them apart. Um, and, Probably never get a look at this, but the mountain lion kittens actually have these beautiful blue eyes. So I put that up. Again, that long tail. So I do have a few slides after this just, just to show um, kind of what the different uh, sort of similar species in the area look like. Um, this one's a photo of a bobcat. Again, see that short little tail that it has. Um, it's got a lot of more striping and modeling than uh, mountain lion would. Bobcats. Average, you know, 20, 25 pounds, which is a lot smaller than even an 80-pound uh, full-grown female mountain lion. And then the, that photo up in the corner uh, really shows uh, the difference between the size of the smallest one being a house cat and then the bobcat and a mountain lion, um, which appears much, much bigger than the bobcat. Um, so I get 
picture sent to me all the time, and I'm always kind of looking in the background of the picture to judge the size of the actual animal um, to try to tell, is it even big enough to be a mountain lion? Um, so go ahead to the next slide. Um, this one's a coyote. Again, it's got that long tail, but it's much bushier. Um, those really pointed ears, really long snout um, on the face of the coyote, and these what I call like scrawny little legs there. Um, and again, smaller than a mountain lion. Um, you know, even if it was a big coyote at like 40 pounds, um, which we don't often see, still much smaller again than the, than even an 80 pound um, uh, female mountain lion. Uh, and then this is a house cat. Um, again, it's like just another photo that I was sent. Somebody was really worried that there was a mountain lion in their backyard. Um, you start looking at it, look at the coloration, the, the striping, just generally the size. Um, not a mountain lion at all, but uh, you know, house cats, depending on how well they're fed, probably about 10 pounds, a lot smaller again. And then <clears throat> this one's a little tricky because the coloration is really right. Sorry, the sun is in my face. Um, I'm not used to being in my office this late. Um, and uh, the uh, the coloration on this guy definitely has that tawny color. Um, but if you start looking maybe at the rocks behind it, you start looking for that the dark uh, striped muzzle um, of a mountain lion, it starts looking a lot more like a house cat. So. Um, I did verify with a couple other biologists, yeah, we think this is a house cat. So that's what we settled on for this guy. Um, and then this one is an actual mountain lion. Uh, uh, someone sent me this picture saying, I just took the picture and when I looked at it later, uh, back on the computer, I saw this guy's face in it. Um, so it's just an example of how they can really uh, camouflage themselves. Um, and they, they can hide very well if they want to. But, uh, yeah, this guy's, you know, somewhere around probably 120 pounds. It's hard to see his body. So uh, that would just be my, my estimate on that guy. So in terms of um, home ranges, the, I got this data from the UCSD Puma Project. It has a number of um, mountain lions collared over the last 10 years. And what they've seen is that the male home range is about 38,000 acres, um, 60 square miles. And as a reference, um, I just looked up, you know, the city of San Francisco is 47 square miles. So um, you would have a, a male mountain lion would actually, their entire territory would be the city of San Francisco. And then a little bit even beyond that. Um, so really big home ranges. and they move throughout that entire home range. Um, they work a circuit. They're not like staying in one spot. You know, they go one spot, maybe they make a kill, they stay there for a few days, and then they're moving to a whole other spot of their territory. Um, and then within this, this very large male territory, you can have uh, three to four uh, female territories. Their territories are smaller, um, about 14,000 acres, 22 square miles. Um, so you could potentially maybe have two females within the city of San Francisco, just as a reference. We don't have any mountain lions living there, by the way. Um, and, and then, uh, you know, male sort of overseeing those. Um, and one thing that I uh, always am telling people, you know, where you have deer, there's always potential to have mountain lions. And so that's really what um, keys, keys us into suitable mountain lion habitat, you know, is are there prey items? And, and how dense are those prey items? And that's going to really um, drive the size of the territories. If they can, if they can find food, they can be packed in a little bit tighter. If they're not finding prey, you know, their territories are going to grow in order to be able to feed themselves. So. Go ahead to the next slide. Um, <clears throat> and then their diet. You uh, see, FC Puma Project again. Um, they visited many, many kill sites over the years, and they found that 77%, uh, you know, about 80% of their diet's really made up of deer, and then they take other native wildlife, raccoons, pigs, possums, skunks, turkey, um, whatever 
is big enough to give them a meal. Uh, of course, they also go after things that we don't want them to, <laughs> including um, uh, pet cats, house cats, indoor outdoor cats, that kind of thing, um, chickens, uh, goats, and sheep. Um, so that does make up another small portion of their diet. So they have a, uh, mountain lions have a long history in our state. Um, they've gone through a number of different um, uh, listing protections um, or even uh, been hunted over the years. So uh, back in 1907, they were a bounty predator, which meant if you went and got one, brought it into the fish, fish and game then office, you know, you could actually get paid money for bringing them in. Um, then they transitioned to be a non-game mammal and shortly thereafter, they became a, a game mammal, which means you could just hunt them. You wouldn't get paid for it, but you could hunt them legally. Uh, in 1990, some legislation was passed that made them specially protected species, um, which has really been in place. Um, and then uh, I can go over what that means in a second. But also, more recently, um, they have been, become a candidate to be listed as threatened or endangered. Um, which means we have to treat them as such until the Fish and Game Commission decides whether it's warranted to list them as threatened or endangered. Um, and I would just put the caveat in that um, this, this listing uh, as a candidate species is, has been divide, divided the state up. So um, we divide them according to evolutionarily significant units. Um, and so as part of the state, they won't be listed no matter what, and that's the stuff that's further north. But pretty much everything from um, San Francisco south um, is, has the potential to be listed. And so right now we have to treat them as if they are. Uh, so go ahead to the next slide. Um, so the specially protected status is covered under the Fish and Game Code 4800. Um, Anyone that wants to read through code um, can Google that and easily uh, be able to pull it up. And um, essentially, it says you can't you can't take them. You, we ha we have to leave them alone, and that even goes for the department. Um, under three different circumstances, we could legally kill them. Um, that would include if the depredation permit is issued. Um, depredation permits are issued if a uh, property owner is sustaining damage from a mountain lion, and that's something we go out to verify before we would issue a depredation permit to allow them to do that. Um, if, the, if a mountain lion is a public safety issue, <clears throat> which means somebody's been injured by one, certainly we're going to euthanize it. And then to protect um, the listed bighorn sheep in Southern California, there's some management of mountain lions allowed under the Fish and Game Code for that. Go ahead to the next slide. Um, so a lot of folks say, well, if we can't hunt them, you know, what is really managing their their population size? You know, why they're probably everywhere now, but there are definitely a number of things um, that that are limiting their abilities to, to survive out there. We don't just need to hunt them in order for that to happen. Um, things like roadkill, we do get a lot of roadkill. Um, in San Mateo County, uh, we pull probably uh, six to ten off of 280. That those are just the ones we find um, in the, that Edgewood Park area. They they tend to want to cross there for whatever reason, um, and 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 definitely are getting hit. Um, there's other things, um, territorial disputes. If there's a dominant male that's maintaining his territory, and another younger male comes in, they get in fights. Um, and often uh, one ends up just getting killed from that. Um, there's a lot of infanticide that goes on. Um, males will come into a den site and, and kill the baby because they're not sure if those babies are, are there, theirs or not. Um, so Puma Project uh, does some work on that and definitely um, documented that, that that's going on at a, at a fair, fairly high rate. Um, then uh, they're, you know, as I alluded to before, they're they're limited by the habitat and prey availability out there. So there's not going to be more lions than there's food available for them. And other things um, are affecting them. Disease. We had one with mange a few years ago. Um, it didn't make it. Um, and then the depredation permits that I discussed, and also, you know, 
know, just whatever illegal pushing might be going on out there. So, uh, they're having a hard time, regardless of uh, legal hunting or not. So there was a bulletin that came out in 2013 um, that really categorized for us, like, when I get a call, I saw a mountain lion or what, uh, you know, I had an interaction with a mountain lion. There's four different things, you know, we, we want to plug it into one of these things so then we can figure out what the next step for these guys is. Um, and so the first one is, is simply a sighting and a lot of these uh, ring cameras that have been put up are catching these sightings. Um, most of the ones I get are in the middle of the night. Um, so it's seen by the public, it's not unusual behavior. It may be in a spot that we're not used to seeing it, but uh, if we were all asleep in our beds um, without the ring camera, we, we wouldn't know that it even walked by. Um, so sometimes, it's, you know, with social media, there might be a little bit of an illusion that um, there's more roaming around, but um, it could just be that we're able to capture these ones that are now roaming around in the middle of the night, or before we weren't, we didn't have cameras up to, to document. Um, and then, yeah, so if somebody calls me and says, you know, I lost a sheep last night, I woke up and it was dead uh, in the pen, um, that would be considered a depredation. I would go out or one of our law enforcement um, wardens would go out and verify, yes, this was killed by a mountain lion, and then they can decide if they want to get a depredation permit to kill that lion or not. Um, potential human conflict uh, is uh, if the mountain lion is in a weird place or is acting strangely. Um, this is the call where it's like the mountain lion's in my backyard and it's not leaving and it's like, you know, one o'clock in the afternoon, you know, what should we do? Um, so we would certainly figure out what's going on, respond, and then make a decision on what needs to be done. And I'll go into that more on the next slide. Um, and then the fourth one is public safety, which is, you know, Hopefully, you're calling 911 first. We're getting, you know, somebody there uh, right as quickly as possible. That's if somebody, you know, somebody's been injured by a mountain lion. Um, so, immediate action on that part. Um, so, go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, so, the potential human conflict is that one that this mountain lion's in a weird place. Um, I don't often get calls where it's, it's acting weird. Um, but yeah, it's like, it's in my backyard. This one is a picture from, I think, uh, of 2012. There was a mountain lion in Branson Fort Eight Creek uh, in Santa Cruz, and it was down, this creek was channelized, so it was down um, in, a, in a pretty good place away from people, but definitely houses all around on either side of the creek. So we were able to go out, and we decided that we would chemically immobilize it, um, and then, once you do that, uh, you know, there's four choices for these animals that, you know, are in a backyard or in, uh, down in a creek like this. Um, we would either chemically immobilize it and relocate it back to suitable habitat um, if it's injured um, or say it was like young mountain lions. We pulled, we pulled two mountain lion cubs out of Half Moon Bay a couple years ago. And since they were young and still dependent on uh, you know, having a mom that they didn't have anymore, we place those in a zoo. Um, the policy does list that we could send them to a rehab facility if they're injured and then release them, but we don't have any guidelines on that, so that's not really an option, but it's in there just in case we do come up with those guidelines and eventually just want to do that with one. Um, and then the last one is, you know, while we're trying to chemically immobilize it, it, it freaks out, runs, hurts somebody, um, then it can immediately become a public safety and be put down um, on site. So, go to the next slide. Um, and then this is uh, the a summary of attacks in California since 1986. It's all on our website if you wanted to study it a little bit more. I put a quick summary together. So, um, in the last 35 years, there's been 18 documented attacks on people, um, three deaths in that time period, um, which is, if you think about, you know, 35 years of people going in and out of the forest, hiking, walking right by mountain lions, to me that's super low number. Um, a lot of times they're sitting in the bushes and, you know, I'm sure I've walked by them a number of times and, and uh, nothing's happened. So uh, 
you like to say that it's a, a more likely to be struck by lightning <laughs> than to be attacked by a mountain lion. So I pulled some statistics uh, that I found on the uh, NOAA website um, that documented 14 deaths in that same 35-year uh, time period from being struck by lightning. So just something to keep in mind. Um, I just don't want people, um, you know, not wanting to go out in open space and enjoy the outdoors because they're concerned about it. Um, of course, we should be aware of our surroundings, but um, I think it's super rare that it happens. So, um, oh, I also put uh, domestic dog attacks up there too. So, again, more likely than probably getting attacked by mom. So, just some perspective there. So if you are out and you do encounter a mountain lion, um, what is it that we, we would want you to do? Number one, don't run. Stop where you are. Stand tall. Get as big as you can. Get your jacket up above your head. Get your bag up there. Um, if you have your kids with you, have them come over, pick them up. Um, be loud. Uh, if you can get a hold of a rock to throw at it or you, ha you happen to have some pepper spray to spray at it, um, Speak firmly, uh, and then if you can, uh, slowly, you know, slowly, slowly back away just to put some space between you and that animal. Um, and then also, if in the rare event that a mountain lion does attack, we tell you fight back because it's going to freak out, and a lot of people have, you know, gotten a mountain lion to run off uh, if that's the case. So be as big as you can and be loud. Um, and then also, uh, when you're when you're out and about, just be aware of your surroundings. Um, and I don't know about wearing those earbuds. Uh, if I'm out and about, I, I don't want to have earbuds in. I want to like be able to hear what's going on and look around. Um, hiking or biking or jogging in groups is good. Uh, much less likely a, a mountain lion's going to approach because of that. Um, and then also mountain lions are most active um, from dusk until dawn. So if you're out jogging and hiking, you know, try to do it uh, a little bit like in the middle of the day, more like. And then also, of course, keep a close eye on your children, supervise them when they're out in your yard playing, and um, don't approach a mountain lion. You know, we, we had one that was hanging out by trails um, at a park in San Jose, and we were just people are trying to approach it with their selfie stick, take a picture. So let's let's never approach a mountain lion. It's not a good idea. Let's give them some space. Okay, and then another thing to think about is um, that whole idea of where there's deer, there's mountain lion. So let's try to keep the deer out of the neighborhood to have less attractants um, for the mountain lion to even want to come come around. Um, so you can do things like um, deer-proof your landscaping, um, and you also, in order to keep, you know, any other wildlife out, you know, we say, you know, not even any bird feeders, because bird feeders, the, the seed will fall on the ground, and then you'll get rats and other things, and then stuff comes in to eat the rats, and the mountain lion comes in to eat them. Um, so it's, it's um, definitely a cascading effect there. So close up your trash cans, seal up your compost piles, and um, uh, also pets tend to be a bit of an attractant. Um, there was one mountain lion that was collared up in the Felton area, and it was documented as only eating like indoor-outdoor cats, uh, and that was its specialty. So um, bring those pets inside, keep them inside. Um, and if they need to go out, maybe in the middle of that, again, that time period in the middle of the day when hopefully the mountain lions are, are back down and, and not out hunting. And then get your neighbors to follow those, those tips. You gotta have the neighborhood uh, come together on that. So. Garbage. Oh yeah, just seal up your garbage. Um, and then water sources, especially throughout year like this, can be, um, definitely an attractant. Um, I've talked to a number of folks, like the mountain lion came in and was drinking from my fountain in my front yard or whatever. So um, yeah, maybe drying those out 
um, especially at sort of at the end of summer when things are really looking for water that can bring them in for sure, including deer, which then bring the mountain lion. Uh, one thing uh, I like to tell folks is to have these motion sensor lights around the house. It doesn't necessarily scare the mountain lions off, but it allows uh, humans coming and going from the house to be able to see, um, like, okay, yeah, it's, it's fine, everything's lit up, I can get to my car safe, and there's not there's nothing out here. Um, mountain lions are, are ambush predators. They like to hide. So if you have a lot of brush in your yard, uh, you might want to consider just trimming that up so you can see your yard when you're out there. You know everything's fine. There's nothing nothing hiding in there. Um, and and then if you have uh, any livestock, uh, sheep, goats, rabbits, chickens, make sure those are sealed up good uh, in your enclosures with a sturdy roof. Um, you know, mountain lions can jump like 16 feet straight up in the air. So you got to have a roof on those things or they'll just jump over any kind of fence that you put up and, and get in there. Um, and then pets, the same. You know, a lot of people, are they, they let their dogs out in the middle of the night because they got to go potty, um, but that's, that's a huge exposure um, to them. So you could build a, an enclosure for them to just like a little dog run for them to go out um, and go potty in there uh, so you know they're safe. And um, otherwise, you know, it's your turning on lights, making lots of noise, that kind of thing, make sure everything's out, out of the way. And then lastly, um, just because so many um, cats uh, and to a lesser extent dogs do get picked off by mountain lions, just something to, to understand that if you do have a cat or, or a dog that, that and you're near adjacent to mountain lion habitat, you could lose it. Um, of course, you could lose it to something like a coyote as well. But just assuming a little bit of risk, knowing that, yeah, I really like having this indoor outdoor cat, and I don't really want to lock it up all the time. But knowing that um, that's a choice that you're making and that it, it's possible that it could get uh, um, preyed upon. Um, and then just thinking, um, as, as we talked about in the beginning of this, that that uh, San Bruno does have a lot of mountain lion habitat uh, adjacent to it. So things are going to be moving in and out. And these are just uh, my references. I think that's, that's kind of the conclusion of the, the big things I wanted to cover. And um, I can, I'm happy to answer questions when we, when we get there. Um, I'm not sure what this, you want to go to the next slide, we'll take a look at it. Yeah. Do you want me to cover this or did you want to go for this? You know what, Tara, uh, why don't you uh, keep going? Okay, no problem. Um, so going back to the, the four categories that we um, uh, put these interactions in, um, if it's simply just a sighting, what are we going to do with that? That's, you know, I was driving along and a mountain lion ran across the road in front of me. Um, if you're in suitable habitat, you're driving on skyline or something, um, or you know you're real close to suitable habitat, maybe your house is near that, um, we don't necessarily need that to be reported. Um, we can log it um, in our online database, uh, but um, you know there's, there's no real threat to that. We, we know they're all over the Santa Cruz Mountains. Um, the next category, the depredation category, especially if you're um, going to want to see about getting a depredation permit, you're going to want to contact. Um, you can contact our office. You can do the online reporting. I think the website's probably on the next slide. So um, it's an online database. You put your information. Oh, it's up there, I guess. Yeah, uh, in the corner. Um, and also, you can find it if you just go to our main website. If you scroll down. Um, uh, there's a, a, a click that you can do for um, conflict wildlife, and that'll lead you into that to report it. Um, so yeah, we, we want to know if you're losing goats and sheep. We want to track that stuff. Um, they can move through neighborhoods and that kind of thing. Um, so definitely report those to us. Um, the potential human conflict, um, it's, it's a little bit of a, a, a gray, like obviously if it's a 
an immediate threat, you're just call 911, don't even think about it. But if it's something like you got it on your ring camera last night at 2 in the morning, um, if you call us, there's no way for us to show up. The mountain lion's most likely long gone. Now, if it's still sitting in your backyard, that's, that's more of a 911 call, or you could call our dispatch number. Probably the easiest thing is, is 911, and then and they know how to dispatch to our law enforcement um, to get those things going. Um, and then, and things like the um, unusual behavior, like it was up walking around during the day, um, but maybe it's kind of already gone. Those are the things, yeah, we want to report on those so we know what's happening. But again, if it's, if it's on the move, it's, it's unlikely that we can show up and, um, and do anything, but we do want to track where has it been, is it continuing these behaviors, are they escalating, that kind of thing. So we'd want those reported. Um, and then uh, public safety is if somebody's been injured by a mountain lion, call 911 um, right away. So um, hopefully that was clear um, on that. I know the potential human conflict um, is, you know, some people may think something is a conflict that uh, isn't always necessarily a conflict. Um, and, of course, if it's immediate threat, call 911. But otherwise, definitely report, report it to us. And Terrence, when we talk about in or adjacent to suitable habitat, for San Bruno, when we looked at the map, uh, it's really 280 and west, right? So above Highway 280, which is the most significant mountain lion habitat in our in our area, correct? Correct, yeah. So if the ones that are getting across 280 and sort of moving around these urban areas, I think it's useful for us to know about those. That would fall under that, like, unusual location, but if it's, if it's gone and you can't show up and do anything, there's, there's not necessarily a reason to call 911, but definitely report it to us. Um, this most recent mountain lion that was in San Francisco, you know, we were getting reports for two or three days before we were able to show up and do something, but us knowing ahead of time, like, it's kind of moving into this neighborhood and then out um, is good because we can sort of, who's, you know, who's going to be on duty during the time and, you know, Get, getting all your supplies ready to respond to it. So some heads up is definitely a good thing. Yeah. Um, yeah, again, so there's the website um, for the online reporting database. Uh, and then that's really just for these, you know, unusual interactions or unusual uh, locations that they're seeing. Um, for the ones where uh, you're not even sure if it was a mountain lion and it's long gone, um, you don't need to report those. Um, there's not much follow-up, uh, if any, that you can do on those regardless. Um, and then again, I'll just reiterate, if it's an immediate threat, call them one one. So. Okay. Uh, and now we're at our Q&A section. So, um we will stop screen sharing. And uh, uh, Melissa, our city clerk, will you provide instructions on raising your hand? I do not see that we have any um, individuals on the phone, but will you give instructions both ways? If you are listening in as an attendee, you should see an option on the bottom of your screen to raise your hand. If you're calling in by phone, you can press star nine, raise your hand. There's currently one hand raised, two hands, two hands raised. Uh, the first is Jeffrey Tong. Hello, thank you for uh, the presentation, uh, Jerris. Have a couple of questions. First one is uh, you mentioned there's about eight deaths uh, around Redwood City, Edgewood, I-280 uh, area. <coughs> Excuse me. What's the suitability for building a wildlife bridge over by Edgewood, Redwood City? Uh, well, I would actually advocate for not building a bridge. Um, there's not a lot of ha suitable habitat on the other side of 280. We don't really want to funnel them there. Um, I know, like the Emerald Hills, Edgewood Park, they there's deer that are there, and so the mountain lions try to go there. Um, but it's, it's not a good situation. We don't really want them over in that area. Um, so I, I would not advocate for that, I guess. 
that are they're essentially just following the deer. Correct. Yeah. Yep. So, do you have a lot of deer uh, fatalities there too? Um, I don't hear from Caltrans. I, you know, I specifically ask them to contact me when they do have a mountain lion, so I hear about those a lot more. Um, I do have numbers from years ago when they used to report it, and you know, um, I don't have them in front of me, but I would imagine it's a fair amount of um, deer also being hit by cars. Correct. Oh, okay. What is the hazard of uh, too many tranquilizers? I don't know if you call it too many, but if you have tranquilizing the mountain lion, if you get tranquilized several times, is there any long-term effects on them? Uh, not that I'm aware of. Yeah, I mean, their system just burns it off. Uh, it probably feels like a horrible, the worst hangover you've ever had. And, uh, <laughs> and then uh, I think... Uh, I haven't heard that. I mean, I don't think we get that many in hand um, and tranquilize them, you know, more than I'd say two or three times. Uh, I don't. I don't think it's an issue. I've never heard of it being an issue. You mentioned depredation could be property versus life, and uh, it could include goats, usually goats and sheep. But uh, aren't all Aren't all animals considered sentient creatures, or are they still considered, certain ones considered property at this point in time? And you mentioned the potential human conflict. If their territory, females around 22 miles and about 60 miles of for males, doesn't that pretty much say all of our urban areas are mountain lion territory, so how is it that they're out of their area or in their area, in their territory? You know, we're all in their territory, isn't it? Oh. <laughs> well, it's not, I mean, the urban areas aren't really suitable for them uh, for long term. Uh, I think they're, they'd run out of food pretty quick. Um, or end up getting hit by a car or, you know, end up hurting a person. We don't want them in those areas where there's lots of human, potential for human interaction. Um, do you uh, tranquilize, relocate? Or, I mean, I, I don't see any justification for killing it. I mean, if it's in those areas, unless it's human life that is threatened, yes? That, yeah, that's exact. That's exactly what our policy says, actually. Yeah. Um, so, number one, we don't want to do anything, but oftentimes we do need to get involved. If if it's close enough to open space, um, we try, if it, and we think this will work, we don't do anything, and in the morning you wake up and the lion's gone, right? But sometimes we still have to do something, and, um, you know, 98% of the time, that's chemical immobilization and moving it back into suitable habitat. We're, we're not euthanizing them unless they've injured a person. Okay. Uh, yeah, and then going back to the your depredation uh, permit question, the, the code basically says that if you sustain damage, you can request a depredation permit from us. So we have to verify that you uh, sustain some kind of property damage um, in order to, to get one. Is that material, or is that like goats and sheep, like animals? Yeah, it's it's pretty much yeah livestock, right? Goats, sheep, oh. cow, or whatever. Yeah, llama yes. sometimes, alpaca, something like that. Oh, okay. You okay. mentioned that, um, in order to uh, discourage mountain lions from going into urban areas, you recommend uh, eliminating the water source and uh, maybe even um, leaf debris or things like that, but aren't you also eliminating all wildlife from urban areas? Because leaf debris is habitat for amphibians. Uh, all animals need water. Um, it's kind of a hard call, isn't it? Well, it's, uh, I would say you, we would leave it up to the homeowner and their comfort level, right, um, and what they feel like they need to do to feel safe on their property. So mm -hmm. certainly I wouldn't say across the board everyone should go remove all this stuff. But, 
people that are really concerned or have had a lot of sightings and want to make sure they're not going to be coming on the property, there's these measures that you can take. Okay. Thank you, Jeffrey. Uh, let's go to the next uh, questioner. Thank you. The next questioner is Kay Ron. Just one moment. Hi, thank you so much for hosting this meeting. I unfortunately did miss the beginning for about 15 minutes, so I guess would I be able to get a copy or a recording of this after you're done so I could revisit the beginning of this meeting? Yeah, so we, we will post the uh, PowerPoint to the city's homepage, uh, and uh, we will look into sending you uh, a video as soon as possible. Uh, it is also... Uh, Hello, hello, hello. <laughs> it's been on, our, on our YouTube channel, uh, and so you may be able to back up on YouTube and uh, see more. Okay, I'll take a look at San Bruno, the city of San Bruno YouTube. Okay, thank you. I see no other hands raised. Okay. Last call for questions. Oh, looks like we have resident Malcolm Robinson. Hi. Go ahead, um, Thank you for doing this. We've had mountain lion encounters, and we, you know they've been in the neighborhood and neighbors' houses. And I appreciate the information you shared, um, particularly about not calling San Bruno police every time we see one on the back hillside, but alerting the Department of uh, uh, Wildlife. So thank you much for this effort. It is a, something we've had to deal with up here for the last few years, and I appreciate your recognizing that and putting this together. Good work. For everyone uh, that attended, uh, it was our pleasure uh, to put this together. Uh, thank you again uh, to Terrace Castine uh, for partnering uh, with the City of San Bruno on this. And so last call for questions, if we don't see any more hands, um, uh, have a good evening. Oh, one more hand. Uh, let, let's take it. It's our goal to uh, answer questions and provide information. So it uh, looks like, Jean, you raised your hand, but then it went away. Hi, my name's Jean. I'm with NBC Bay Area News. Thanks for taking my question. You said that you've had seven mountain lion sightings in the last year, I believe, and then you gave us five examples. What are the other two? Uh, sure. So, uh, let's clarify that. The um, five examples were four videos uh, from the Ring camera network, uh, and then uh, we... Uh, talked about an incident that was in San Bruno on May 25th. That is, all of those instances are separate from instances that are reported to the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. And so some of them actually may be a part of the, the eight, uh, but when we show the sample incidents in our area, that was really the one from, from San Bruno and the four that we located uh, on the camera network. We actually do not know uh, if if those instances were reported to Fish and Wildlife. But I'll turn it over to Terrace Castine to talk a little bit more about uh, the incidents that were reported to the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. Sure. Um, I think you were talking about um, the incidents we were talking where the lion showed up in an urban area and we had to respond to that. Um, so those are the ones that we've been tracking. Um, the, the actual, just like I saw a mountain lion or it's on the ring camera, um, I didn't go through and, and add all those up for the last year. But um, what that did, I think the number it was six or seven um, in, incidents that we responded to in urban areas where a mountain lion had wandered into a city, and we had to go decide, okay, what are we going to do? And, and those happened in the last year. Normally, we have one or two of those that we have to do something with. Um, Several of those, we were able to do that thing where we do nothing and we just make sure people are safe. Um, and in the morning, they're gone. Um, and 
and a few of them we had to chemically immobilize, move them back into suitable habitat, um, and, and track them that way. So those incidents um, have been up, and um, there's no way for us to know exactly why. Uh, it could be drought related, it could also be fire related, um, and the habitat loss that we had in the Santa Cruz Mountains. But definitely um, a lot more this last year coming out of uh, out of the mountains than in the these urban areas and causing us to respond. Does it, was that your question? Thank you. Okay. Looks like we have one more question. Again, I'm sorry if I missed this part of the meeting where you might have answered this, but do we have a population count of mountain lions in that immediate area? Have you guys been tracking them at all uh, to know that number for the population of mountain lions? Um, <clears throat> we don't. Uh, we are in the middle. We did a, um, a, a study where we went through and collected stats of mountain lions in the Santa Cruz Mountains, and that, along with um, some caller data we have, we hope to get a population estimate for the Santa Cruz Mountains. That, that data is still being analyzed. Uh, the DNA is uh, still being analyzed by our lab. So we don't have any numbers at this point. Um, at one point, um, uh, the, the UCSD Puma project, their study area, they thought probably had about 40 mountain lions in it. Um, but their study area doesn't cover San Bruno Mountain. It's just it was it's mostly Santa Cruz County and a little bit into San Mateo County. So. Um, yeah, the, the stuff further north in the, the San Bruno area, we're not sure what's going on there as of right now. Thank you. Okay. Um, again, uh, thank you very much. Um, have a good evening.